welcome to the first Saturday reading of London's second Words Festival. This morning we're featuring three authors, London writer Brian Davis, Julie Berry from St. Thomas, and Kingston writer Carolyn Smart. And the common thread this morning is that each of these authors has a new book published this year with a London publisher. My name is Karen Schindler and I'm here on behalf of Baseline Press and I'm pleased to be hosting the session along with Kitty Lewis from Brick Books and publisher Mike O'Connor from Insomniac Press. Brick Books, the oldest of the three, was started here in London in 1975 by Don Mackay and Stan Dragland and it is today the only Canadian trade book publisher that produces exclusively poetry. This fall, Brick released Carolyn Smart's collection titled Kareen, which is a poetic, dramatic rendering of the story of Bonnie and Clyde. Insomniac Press was founded in 1992. It started out as a small poetry press and then expanded into fiction and nonfiction, and today includes some special niche publications such as celebrity writer as musician books. Last spring, Insomniac published Brian Davis's debut novel titled Squarehead, which is set in Montreal and looks at issues of social media and the Anglo-Franco divide. And the youngest of the three, Baseline Press, was started here five years ago, and it's a micropress that publishes poetry in limited edition handmade chapbooks. Last month, Baseline published Julie Berry's I Am Etc., the Gilbert White poems based on the life of an 18th century naturalist. So this morning we have one novelist and two poets whose most recent works lean towards the narrative as poetic responses to the stories of actual historical figures. London is and has been home to many publishers over the years, including Pendas Productions, Ergo Press, and Pigeon Bike Press, to name a few. We want to thank you for coming out this morning to hear just a sample of some of the wonderful literary work being published in this city. First to introduce Insomniac novelist Brian Davis is publisher Michael Connor from Insomniac Press. Thanks, Karen. So, um, Brian Davis is a uh, native Londoner, uh, but he has he has spent time in Whistler, where else? Montreal, Laurentian region of Quebec. Uh, he's graduate of the Concordia Creative Writing uh, MA program, uh, where he studied under the 2013 Man Booker International Award uh, finalist Jessup uh, Nakovich. Right. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I've met him. He's an amazing writer. And was the recipient of the 2012 David McKean uh, Award for uh, Most Outstanding Creative Writing Thesis. Um, that's Brian, not Joseph. Right? So um, his, writing, his writing has appeared in uh, online, uh, online uh, publications like uh, The Barnstormer and The Smoking Jacket. And Squarehead is his first published novel. So. Here he is, Brian Davis. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction, Mike. And of course for Insomniac for bringing this book to the world. I wouldn't be here without you guys, quite literally. Uh, and thank you all for coming out. And thank you to the organizers of Words Festival for having me. Um, so I'm going to read a section from fairly early on in the book. Um, we'll see how far we get through it. I uh, kind of catch you up quickly to where we are. Our man, Corey Bonsfield, uh, has been out the night before at his girlfriend's poetry reading rather than watching a Montreal Canadiens playoff game. Uh, they lose the game. He's not happy about the whole thing. He insults her later in the evening, and she breaks up with him and kicks, her out of, kicks him out of her house. Rather, uh, He goes home and proceeds to drink the remainder of a bottle of whiskey, wakes up quite hungover, wishing that he had just a little bit of marijuana to take the edge off. But of course, he doesn't. Uh, and then it occurs to him that perhaps a neighbor can help. Uh, I will warn you, there's some language and some mild drug use. All right, so here we go. Drago's my downstairs neighbor, one of them. He lives in number two, just inside the front door, and it always stinks of weed outside his room, so I think maybe he can help me. I hope he can help me. Drago's a big Slavic monster, tall, broad-shouldered, fit, like Bill, clearly works out, with short cropped blonde hair, sort of looks like his namesake from Rocky IV. Actually, I'm not sure his name's really Drago. People might just call him that because he looks like Dolph Lundgren. Whatever he's called, he's an imposing figure. 
always has a serious kind of threatening or disapproving look on his face, even when he's smiling. Like he's always just about to ask what the hell you're looking at, or want, or are doing here. But he's friendly enough, I guess. Not that we've talked, but we say hello, we nod, we acknowledge each other exist and live in the same building. So that's a start. One of us is bound to need a favor eventually. I'm not too comfortable with this, a little nervous about knocking, showing up unexpected for the first time ever and asking for drugs. Well, weed anyway. But fuck it, I want to get stoned. Quinn still ain't answering. Also, not having any gitch on is throwing me off. I couldn't find a single pair in my entire room. Jeans without underwear is a rough and itchy adventure. Man, I hope he's not sleeping. It's well afternoon. Drago doesn't answer on the first knock, but I hear voices. Do I knock again? I still hear voices. Drago doesn't answer on the second knock. A tall, angular girl does, though. Probably his girlfriend. She looks like a gypsy princess or a Russian tennis player. She has long, straight, dark hair, almost black, high cheekbones, a pointy little nose, and sparkling green eyes. It's something but her face is off. Kind of strange. She's wearing an oversized man's dress shirt with a red paisley pattern that's hanging off her left shoulder, a scarf tied around her head like a bandana, fuzzy pink leg warmers, and not a lot else. Maybe nothing else. She sort of closes the door on herself, half inside and half out, and leans into me, exposing a good deal of cleavage, which my eyes dart down to, but not for too long. And she says, yes, in a tone somewhere between a challenge and a question. Uh, hi, I'm Corey, I live upstairs. Hello, Corey from upstairs, I'm Radmila. She extends a hand and I shake it. What are we expecting you? There's that tone again. Ah, uh, no, no, I don't think so. I force a smile, I hope it's friendly, not creepy. Well, can I help you? She opens the door back up a bit as she says this and crosses one long leg over the other. Nice, nice legs. Uh, yeah, maybe. God, I hope his name is really Drago. Is Drago around? I ask. Even though I've already heard him and I can see him over her shoulder in a wife beater and gray sweatpants, waving at me from the couch. Hey, man, what's up? Shh, Bram, you're ruining daddy's career. Uh, hey, man, what's up? Drago rises up off the couch and Radmilla steps back and I want to step inside, but I'm afraid to ask. So I stand in the doorway feeling awkward. Grab a, uh, Drago grabs something off I can't make out off the coffee table and thrusts it towards me, right in my face. Look at this shit, man, look. He hands it to me with some force and I fumble with it. It's a matchbook with five or six small burns on it. I found this shit on stoop, man. They're doing drugs, man. Who, I ask as he pushes up on me, forces me back in the hall, closing the door, almost slamming the door behind him. Maybe I picked a bad time to introduce myself. I'm certainly not at my best. I ain't sure my request's gonna be well received. Crackheads, man, who else? They burn, they use their cigarette to pick up the crack rock. They smoke their crack on our stoop. Fucking dirty big bastards. Last week, man, I found one sleeping inside the door, right here. He rushes past me and throws open the inside door of the vestibule, pointing. He stinks piss and shit like the vomit of the universe, man. I had to kick the fucker just to wake up the son of a bitch. It's two feet from my front door, man. Dirty crackheads could walk right in, right to my face. He gets in my face to illustrate his point. I pity the crackhead who walks into Drago's. I call the landlady, man. She does nothing. She says it's neighborhood. I say, if neighborhood's so bad, you fix door lock. But she does nothing. Yeah, she's pretty useless. I'm trying to be agreeable. I'm trying not to look scared. Yeah. Drago slaps my chest hard with the back of his hand, and I think of my puke. Fucking right. She's useless. I'd fix myself, but she'd never pay me back. Probably not, man. Probably not. I need to get back upstairs, or at least off my feet. This is way more than I'm ready to deal with. Drago exhales forcefully and throws his hands up in frustration, and I have no idea what he's about to do next. Like, none. I take a defensive stance just in case, but he doesn't notice. He just shakes his head and heads back into his place. Come, come, he says. You like smoke joint with us? I could kiss this man. <laughs> you have no idea, I say with a laugh, and he looks at me sort of puzzled, so I add, yes, yes, I would love to smoke a joint with you, just so that there's no confusion. Drago smirks and lays his giant mitt on my shoulder and leads me inside. Drago's place could almost be called an apartment. It has two distinct rooms, the kitchen, which is large enough for a small table, and the everything else room with a futon currently folded into a couch, a low, low rectangular glass table, and a big home entertainment unit on the wall just inside the door. The table's covered in all sorts of trash, ashtrays, pop cans, dirty utensils, cigarette butts, bits of tobacco and weed. The floor is not a lot better. The big selling feature to his pad is the bay window that looks out onto the street, nearly covers the whole wall. On the opposite wall, above the couch bed, there's a giant red, white, and green striped flag. Hungary or Bulgaria. It's not the one with the little rifle-toting French dude. And on the far wall, above a large wooden desk, is a collage of snapshots of what must be family and friends pasted to a corkboard. People gathered around tables in what look like bars and banquet halls, vacation photos, beaches and ski resorts. You want the coffee, man? Drago asked, disappearing into the kitchen. Yes, please. Things are definitely looking up. Once inside, the full stench of the place hits me. 
It's a strange smell, animalistic and musty, I mean. Skip to page, huh? I mean, it's sweat and sex and stale cigarettes, half-empty beer bottles, marijuana, dirty laundry, but there's something else, too, something stronger, something that's overpowering all the others. I'm trying to decipher what it is as I take a seat on the rolling office chair, which is just inside the door, suspiciously far from the desk, and Radmilla shuffles down the couch towards me, her head below her knees, looking underneath. Look at this little weasel, she says, shoveling something furry up from under the couch and shoving it in my face. It looks like a fuzzy snake. What the hell is that thing? It's ferret. You've never seen the ferret? She looks shocked. Looks like I just told her I'd never eaten a pear. The little creature hops out of her grip and onto my lap and scurries up my arm and starts sniffing and licking my ear. Well, don't be scared. He can't hurt you, she assures me, giggling. But it's a creepy sensation and I'm not in the mood. Plus, this thing's even smellier up close. Radmilla notices I'm uncomfortable and takes the beast back, coddling it, rocking it in her arms, stroking its head. So soft. You'd make a very nice coat for it. I attempt to smile. Are you okay? She asks suddenly, laying a hand on my knee. You don't look too good. And gee, thanks for noticing. And this from someone who doesn't even know how I look. Uh, hangover. Big night last night, man. Drago asks, popping his head around the corner from the kitchen. Uh, not so much big, but a bad night. What happened? Rad me laughs, which seems like genuine concern. Drago's head had disappeared before I even finished answering. Not sure I want to get into this. Not sure I want to talk. But then I don't want to be rude. My girlfriend and I had a fight. Sorry, she says, slumping her shoulder. She's a blonde girl, face looked like a bulldog. A bulldog? Uh, she's blonde, yeah, she kinda has a little pug nose, if that's what you mean. A bulldog? Why do you think the girl looks like dog? Drago asks, coming in with three mugs clumped together in his left hand, sugar, milk, and spoons in the right. I didn't, she said she looked like a bulldog. I point an accusing finger at Rodamilla. I never said that, a bulldog. Drago puts the sugar and milk on the table and lets the spoons fall, crashing together, clanging together, ringing in my head. Where's that joint? He lays the mugs down, selecting one with a black and red crest encircled in Cyrillic writing for himself, pushing the pink Betty Boop one to Radmilla, and leaving me a skull-shaped one to try to drink from. I skip a spoonful of sugar and drop it into the very hot, very black, very strong-smelling coffee and stir. Precisely the effect I wish some pot was having on my head at the moment. This skull mug weighs a ton, but I hoist it up and take a sip without waiting for the milk. It scalds my tongue and leaves a bitter aftertaste. I put the skull down and try not to look uncomfortable. I really should have showered. Turkish! Drago exclaims unprovoked. It's good, yes? Yeah, great. I return without conviction. Drago looks happy enough, though. Proud, playing host. He settles into the couch and lifts the cigar box off the floor. Radmilla turns towards him, lift, lifting her legs and stacking them together in front of her, across her, exposing her right thigh up to the ass, almost exposing her ass. Don't stare, Corey. I look over at Drago, he's got the box open, his weed supplies spread out. Baggy, grinder, papers, lighter, pipe, scale. I should have been down here ages ago. Drago pops open a little baggie and a new smell wafts into the mix. Sniff, he demands, shoving the butt halfway up my nose. I sniff. Good, yes? It smells dank, I tell him, though I don't really care for this. My weed's the best, most crazy, knock you on your ass, it's called whatever, it won a contest nonsense. But he's opening the door for me. Plus, I've been, I've been wondering when someone was going to ask why I came over. You think you could uh, hook me up with some of that? Like, with your guy or whatever? Drago doesn't say a thing. Doesn't even look up. Like, the next time you're going, or... He delivery. Always delivery. Drago still doesn't look up. Just bits up Bud in his hands and puts it in chunks in the giant grinder, spinning it between his hands. Some of my hands are never bulked out, never became real hands. Not like Drago's. And then again, Drago does construction, manual labor, works unexpected muscles. I can try for you. I call him, but usually Sunday he works. He spins his phone on the table in front of him and dials, turning the phone to speaker. He goes straight to voicemail. He flips his shove at the flick of his wrist. Sorry, man. Pats me on the back before slamming the open grinder on the glass table. It makes coffee leap out of my one skull and echoes through the other. So, Corey, Radmila says in a breathy voice, what does it happen with your girlfriend? What does it you two fight about? She has soft saucer eyes, but something's not right about them. I said something stupid and she overreacted. Freaked out, actually, started throwing things at me, crying, totally hysterical, like salted me. Then she threw me out of her apartment. A contemplative look washes over her, like she's mulling something over. What is it you said? Was it very mean or she's just a total bitch? <laughs> you watched the game last night, man? Drago asks, completely interrupting while running his pinky across the pot in the paper, evening things out. I watch, man. I like hats. In my country, hockey's not sport number one, but here in Canada, I like hockey. He smiles at me, seeking approval. Somewhere the ferret scurries noisily, but invisibly. Yeah, I didn't really watch last night. I had to go to my girl's poetry reading. I turned to Radmilla. That's where the fight started. I wanted to watch the game, but I had to go to her thing. She's something of a self-styled poet. Oh. Radmilla raises her eyebrow and looks strange. Stranger. 
Then she looks over at Drago and back at me, pointing over my shoulder, she says, I paint. I look and there's a canvas in the corner, reds and yellows and oranges and black, swirling and splattered around a face that's nothing but teeth. No eyes, no nose, no ears, no lips even, just jagged, karky teeth. And sutures at the hairline, also jagged, amateurish. And there is hair. I look back at her and nod. Interesting. Thanks. She spins around and leans towards me and I get another glimpse of cleavage. Skin stretched across ribs. I peek over but Drago's oblivious, flicking a big cone of a joint in his index finger, shaking the weed down into place. Radmilla leaves her hand on my knee, so I meet her eyes, her unusual eyes. I think I know why she's angry, your girlfriend. I understand. I have shows, exhibition of my painting at my school or at the cafe or gallery. He, she darts a thumb at Drago, never wants to come for me. Complains he has to come for me. When he's there, he wants to leave. He walk around like a sad man. She drops her shoulder in a mock ape walk. Never looks at anyone else's work. Talks to no one. Not smiling even. Not polite. I must apologize to him all the time. I feel kind of awkward sitting here listening to this with Drago right beside her. It he acts like he can't even hear. It's fairly impressive. He embarrasses me to everyone. Classmates, professors, parents, gallery owners, potential buyers. So I leave him at home. That's it, I said. You don't share with me my passion? Stay away. But this is still my dream. She's getting kind of riled up. Her eyes look even stranger with tears in the corners. This for me makes me very angry. But I accept is not for him. Here, man, light this up. A beautifully sculpted joint and lighter a toss at me. I fumble, almost swishing the dew, but I save it. The lighter crashes at my feet. I scoop it up and pinch the joint between my lips. This is it. I flick the bick. Flame meets paper. I inhale. It's fucking horrible. I didn't see it, but Drago cut this with tobacco. As soon as it hits the back of my throat, I feel a tickle and burst out coughing, and once I start, I can't stop. My eyes well up with tears, my lungs contract. My throat feels like it's being scraped from the inside with every hack. I pass the joint to Radmilla, groping blindly for my coffee skull. Drago laughs. Strong shit, man. Yeah, strong shit, tobacco. I hate it when people roll with tobacco. I hate it and I don't understand it. What are these, war times? Are we rationing? Is there a great weed shortage? It tastes like shit. It ruins the weed. It throws a headache instead of a buzz. What a day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Julie Berry lives and writes just outside of St. Thomas. She is the author of two previous full-length collections, The Walnut Cracking Machine with Bushek Books and Born Thresholds with Brick Books. Julie's poems have appeared in anthologies including Open Wide, A Wilderness, a collection of Canada's best nature poetry. Julie was longlisted for the 2014 CBC Poetry Prize and she won the 2005 Grain Prose Poem Contest. She also wrote and presented a CBC production of Out Front titled The Poetry of the Woods, which won an International Radio Broadcasting Award. Her current chapbook with Baseline is a small section from her next full-length collection, and it's based on her at once imagined but very real relationship with 18th century British naturalist Gilbert White. Please welcome Julie Berry. Thank you very much, Karen. It's wonderful to be here to read from this beautiful, beautiful book. Um, Gilbert White, uh, I've, I met Gilbert White on uh, Dundas Street near Ossington in a bookstore, a journal that kind of uh, was written about his, he had written, kept a journal for about 30 years of his, the last years of his life. And um, I opened that journal and basically fell in love with a man and took him home. And I've been going steady ever since. And um, what I tried, the thing that sort of started this book out was I tried an experiment that I named partner journaling. And I determined uh, his age and um, my age, and I, I sort of figured out when he would be my age. And I kept my journal on as a daily uh, exercise. And I would often, I went outside every day as he did, and I, kept track of his journal entry alongside my journal entry for the day, and I just kept doing that for an interesting thing to do. And eventually, I got quite attached, and I started to write poems. And so um, I'm going to share with you a few of the poems from this book. This poem, oops, this poem uh, includes 
images from his world and my world. And his world was 18th century England, a little village 45 miles southwest of London. And my um, area is outside St. Thomas, and you'll notice if you're familiar with the area, you'll notice some place names from this area mixed in with his home. To shovel your crumbling ma'am. Dump the mix into a sieve. Examine what doesn't make it through. The in-common clods, clumps, twigs, life forms. To write our places on cards, shuffle them, come up with a place where we can meet. Your dunghill, your barrow, my rake, your blossoms and cucumber vines, my fingal, my dogwood in dark standing water, and clay fields beyond my shedden, and I own a station, your lis, your farnum, your landslip, my gravel pit, your hops, my alfalfa, my skunk cabbage, your hellebore, your vale, my mullen, your kite's hill, my Barnum's Gully, your zigzag and haw ha, my little springer, your Coombs Meadow, your oak hanger, my Erie, my kettle. <clears throat> so four of the poems in this collection are actually Gilbert White's words. He made use of the ampersand instead of the, the word and, and I went through his journals for the year 1786, and I collected all the pairs of words joined by ampersands and divided them into the seasons. I'm going to share with you summer because I'm already missing it, even though it, was, it ended yesterday. Summer, night blowing and cloudy dried and cocked my St. Foyne thunder and lightning rain and some hail sings day, and night bursts at a touch, and scatters the dust like White's Grove from Selborne, and says he is drenched with wet, and quantities of hay my little meadow, and finished my haymaking thunder, and great rain oats, and peas are the legs, and sides of horses the male, and female flying ants dark clouds, and rain ripped, and housed with fin tails, and yellow bellies with reins, and almost all oats, and barley. One of the best parts, <clears throat> one of the best parts about writing this book has been my visits to Selborne, the town, or the village where Gilbert White lived his, most of his life. And um, I met people there who have become good friends of mine now. And the poem I'm going to read is about the first time I met um, a woman by the name of June Chatfield, who has a PhD in land snails, a very interesting person, who also knows everything about the natural world in um, Hampshire. I met June Chatfield at One Gracious Street. One Gracious Street was the address of the place I lived when I was staying in, in Selborne. Gracious Street, I cannot say it enough. Gracious Street, meadow to the west, schoolyard to the east, Selborne hangar within view as it always is, unless you are at the base of one of the lifts or on the down. Oh, the names of things are about to be spoken. She knows them all, the Latin and the common for ragwort, and rose bay willow herb, and ground elder, red shank, which is lady, lady's thumb to me. We come upon tiny blue flowers, June identifies them, Veronica Beccabunga. Beccabunga? She doesn't see me tip my head back, mouth the words, oh my God. In Coombs Meadow, we're crouched beside one of the ponds. Her hand stirs the long grass as if it were a pool of still water. Common name, Yorkshire Fog, she tells me. A hand lens worn as a pendant around June's neck and a, small, and a snail on her open palm. There, do you see? She pushes her flattened hand at me, 
holds the lens over the snail. Do you see? And then, I do see. Inside the shell, a very small heart is beating. It's quite something to see the heart of a snail beating. So I went to Selburn, I've been to Selburn now three times, and um, walked in Gilbert White's footsteps. I um, have not been able to get him to come to St. Thomas except in this poem. An English curate in a southern Ontario gully. We were coming in for a landing. I pointed out the gravel pit far below, shaped like a bean. It was early morning, a southern Ontario September, thick fog. School buses delayed two hours. We sat down beside a creek without a name at the bottom of a gully a mile north of Lake Erie, a meandering kind of creek. You can cross a creek like that and still be on the same side. Gilbert was amazed. A raccoon mistook us for shrubs in the gloom. Don't act scared, I said to him under my breath. That's the worst thing you can do. Here's how we got back to 1768. We held our arms in front of us at shoulder height, curved as if we were holding enormous bags of groceries. We began turning counterclockwise. Our left arms pulled us around. Our right arms swung to the front. We began spinning slowly at first, then faster and faster. Keep your head up, Gil, I said. Focus on something that's not moving. The last poem from this collection that I'm going to read is an account of Gilbert's last days in reverse. Unraveling Gilbert's last days. In a few short days, your best friend's son backs away. The tendrils of the cucumber, cucumbers reattach. The strawberries rejoin their stems. Dark puddles of bird blood trickle into the opened carcasses on your work table. The severed is made whole. Limp bodies of bitterns or plovers are laid down and hang like towels over the outstretched arms of pleased boys who carry them to Coombe's Meadow or Knight's Pond, place them in the rushes on a bush. Soon, in clumsy, uneven whirls, the birds are pulled into the sky, shot bursts from their soft breasts. Your garden grows backwards. White blossoms emerge from the dunghill's mire, uncrinkle and tumble up into the barrel ascend en masse into the arms of your weeding woman. She makes small hills of them, spreads the blossoms with her rake. What was green is made white. She forgets her sadness. And I just want to finish off with a poem that is in the larger collection. Gilbert White often got family members to help him with her, his observations and uh, this poem is about his younger brother, Henry. How many nights, how many owls. At dusk, Henry, rector of Fifield, vicar of Uphaven, youngest brother of Gilbert White, crept into the woods by his house with a brilliant piece of 18th century technology, a pitch pipe tuned to concert pitch. Once, Kneeling at my grandparents' bedroom window, I tugged on night's string and dawn light surprised the room, surpassed it. Small as a girl's fist, perched on the outside sill was an owl, its eyes inches from mine. Through those two round windows, yellow sky, each with a sun in total eclipse. How long did Henry stand in the dark, listening, and did he smile as he blew into his borrowed pipe? A, no. A flat, no. B, B flat, B flat. How many nights, how many owls did it take before he announced to his brother that all the owls in the five-field wood hooted in B flat? 
The small feathered orb on the windowsill that morning was a screech owl. Their gentle tremolos descend through the leaves of the dark Ontario woods where I'm from. Thank you very much. and I'm here to introduce Carolyn Smart. Carolyn Smart's five collections of poetry include The Way to Come Home, published by Brick Books in 1993, and Hooked, Seven Poems, published by Brick Books in 2009. She is the founder of the RBC Bronwyn Wallace Award for Emerging Writers, poetry editor for the McLennan series of McGill Queen's University Press, and since 1989 has been professor of creative writing at Queen's University. Hooked, Seven Poems, has become a performance piece featured at the Edinburgh and Seattle Fringe Festivals in 2013 and at Theatre Passe Muraille in 2015 in Toronto. She lives in the country north of Kingston, Ontario. In her most recent book, Kareen, um, from a review recently in Quill and Choir, says, Smart refuses to romanticize her subjects but she also refuses to romanticize the world into which they were unceremoniously dumped. <laughs> Carolyn Smart. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Kitty. Uh, so this is a, a collection of poetry that deals with um, uh, a family of outlaws in Texas in the 1930s, in the middle of the Dust Bowl. And I'm going to start off with an introductory poem that really talks about the history of Texas leading up to that time, Texas, 1930. Starved us off the fields and deafened us with the sawing of insects, the anger and the pungent need. The canyons, the gulf plains, the coast, the lowlands, the hill country, the basin, the range. What do they ask of us now that the soil offers nothing? Hear the thin, distant whisper of the tribes, the mound builders, Pueblo, Apache, Hassane, Comanche, the high singing of the Spaniards, the Mexicans, bleached bones along the Rio Grande, the dust of Sam Houston, the skull of Zachary Taylor, the fallen at the sieges, the dead and dying all across the plains. Wander the land at night and hear the screech owl lament, crying our history, our sad empty fields, how they speak this American shame, this endless churning landscape of our fathers who have lost most all they hold dear. Come to the cities in your wagons, on foot with your mules, your women, your mangy, puling children. Cobble whatever shelter you may. Tell the old tales, mouth the history, taste the dust upon your tongue. Take flight from one border to another. Just keep on in the thermal lift and yearn. There are markers of the rivers, east and west, Pecos, Rio Grande, Brazos, Colorado, red, and still we thirst. And the black oil gushing out and out of the spindle tops, and the strangers who come to town, electric chairs in the back rooms, and the men who throw the switch, and the prison farms with lean and beaten men running before the riders with their guns. The miles covered in cars going nowhere but away from here, and then turning back and back again to the same old gutted roads with faces that stare at you like death is joyriding in the back seat. And the blacks all picked up and went somewhere else when the storms blew in. There was nothing left behind but the weevil and our gaunt faces, faces peeping out at nothing. Now the women's work is over, they lie on pallets, the lack is another part of breathing and the taste of charity in their mouths and their breasts hanging like pockets of despair. 
And who remembers now the hurricanes in Indianola and Galveston, again in Galveston, and the many thousands who died there clutching the Bible to their acquiescent hearts? We walk the streets, line the curbs, forage in the news, lean bewildered against brick warm walls, outrage pooling in our eyes. When will it come, justice and respect? When? Into the long white ribbon of road, the future careens away. I'm going to read five poems from five um, different voices, and the first one is the mother of two members of the Barrow Gang, Kumi Barrow. I had one steadfast wish, avoid the idle day. The devil plays upon a fellow soul. Also, be a helpmeet to my man, raise the children upright. Pray. Choose to live within the dust bowl, sleep beneath the wagon, haul cotton with ribboned hands. Not hard to sweep an earthen floor unless you press your will against the wind, grains speckling your eyes. Taught to read, but only in the Bible. I grew to read the gutters about my children, saw pictures there of widows they made who wore their bri bridal clothes to funerals. It is no lie there was drinking. There is only so much room for endless grief. Few regrets. I'd look forward to the picnics, red beans and rice, fried chicken in the hand. Shrill cicadas in evening light. Listen, why is my youngest out on the road past midnight? Patience wears thin as skin, gunfire all over this land. A human husk I was, yet fierce till the expected came. Forgiveness if I did not bend. Purchased one grave for two loved sons. This poem describes the night that Clyde Barrow met Bonnie Parker for the first time. Clyde at Buster's party. Clarence brought me, and I was looking around when she walked in. The air itself just turned to something new. Blonde hair flying, firecracker eyes exploring everything. And when she seen me, her face, it just blossomed with clear intentions. I couldn't let the chance pass. Stretched out my hand, stood close, brought her next to the window so I could show her which was my fancy ride. Talk going on around us, her blue eyes steady, hair full of light streaming in from the porch. After I kissed her, she gave a little smile and crushed near flat again me when I held her. She, no taller than a pony, thought I could have picked her up and run. Heard she had a husband in the joint. She said it weren't real. She was quick as a hiccup, bored in school. What to do in a hole like Cement City when you're hurting for more and nothing ever happens? Never saw another want the same so fierce to drive and be alive the way we could if we had chances and the world ran right. So Bonnie and Clyde started up a mini gang and within a couple of days they'd asked a teenager to join them. W.D. Jones's tale. I seen Clyde Barrow first when I was five years old. We was all camped out beneath the Oak Cliff Viaduct in Dallas. Nowhere else to go. My kin except Mama and my brothers died of flu, and that's when Mama grew tight to Kumi. They was true friends, those two. We all rode down together picking cotton all the way with the aim to beg a judge to let Buck out of jail. Me and L.C., best of buds those days, grew up together, doing what all we could. I did not read nor write, would do anything for money, stealing bikes and such, and bigger things. L.C. had his daddy's car one Christmas Eve, and we'd been dancing, drinking brew. When L.C.'s brother Clyde said he could use my help, I reckon that was swell. It seemed sort of big to be out there with them, Clyde and Bonnie famous. It was good to know they could count on me. Within one day, Clyde killed Doyle Johnson, 
shot him in the face in Temple, Texas, and I had murder on my head. I'd lived but 16 years. When they say Clyde Champion Barrow was the best, hell, I know that, because I rode with him. He'd drive a thousand miles if he thought the law was close. No way they'd be caught alive. They knew their end. Nights I'd see him on his knees, I reckon praying for his soul or for a longer life. Hell bent on getting round the law, but sometimes he'd get tired. We used to wear each other's clothes. He was a small man, just like me, quiet as a cat with dogs close. Never wanted dirt upon his skin. Never used bad language, though he had a temper, and he and Bonnie sure could fight. Eight months I lasted till I'd had enough of blood and hell. Near Dexter, Iowa, where Buck and Blanche were caught, I took some buckshot to the face and chest, and I was bleeding out. Heck, all of us were hurt real bad. But Clyde, he done took some farmer's car, and we three let a shuck right out of town. I left him. When they'd healed enough, they could get by without me. I hooked it back to Texas and got turned into the law. Did my time, married, found some happiness in life. That damn fool movie made it look so fine, like it was sort of glamorous, our ride. But it was hell. W.D. was one of the people who actually survived and lived a full life, and a lot of the information I took from his interview with Playboy in 1968. The other survivor was um, Blanche Barrow, who actually wrote a memoir when she was in jail. She was married to Clyde's brother, Buck. And this is a poem from her point of view. Blanche remembers the long ride. I used to believe in love, the way believers play their faith, close to the chest, fanning it out when they need it most. I could have used some back there when my mother sold me for a song. A hard-handed man, he broke me, surely. No more hopes for children or a tender word at best. My daddy was a kind man, but so poor he couldn't cope with anything but slow tilling of the dry soil, sun up, sun down, wind that brought the farm indoors. The only thing saved him was his death-like sleep. Yet dreams, dreams go on. Never expected to find what love was really like, how it pulled me to buck like a chigger to the hairline, his warm brown eyes, his hands that mastered anything he put his mind to. We had such plans for living, he and I, in some woodland, bright, safe place, far away from all we'd known before. We would be fine and free. We said so, all the nights in tourist camps, lying awake, listening to passing cars, then the storm of bullets and blood that burst in streams on the floor out of the dead upon their backs. Who could ever have reckoned how bad it would become? The nights I'd sit up on the car and watch the stars taste of terror in my throat and gore on my thin hands. Some nights I couldn't see the moon for all the horror in the way. Or maybe it was hunger or the endless sleepless days when all we had was fame, not the kind I ever wanted, outlaw woman. They didn't even know my real name. I would have gone most anywhere with Buck, but they wouldn't let me be there at the end, both of us broken, no use anymore. When we first met on that road in sad West Dallas, he was the most beautiful man I'd ever seen, and he loved me so. Even my daddy liked him. He was good all the way down to the bone. Went to serve out his whole term because I asked. I wish he'd stayed there now, or maybe gone to school, or left his kin behind. It was all on goddamn Clyde what happened. We were doomed. I knew it from the start. There was so much to hope for in those dusty, early days. His arms around me, all the future still to come. And the final poem is written from the point of view of, of um, Bonnie Parker. The one mistake that Clyde made, he was the best driver on the road, he had the fastest cars, faster than the cop cars, amazing. But the one mistake he made was the night he flipped the car, trying to get away from the cops. Bonnie was underneath the dripping battery and she was burned from the knee to the ankle to the bone. And for the last six months of her life, he basically carried her around. I love the car because within its scope, there is both gratitude and anguish. 
It has saved my life and stolen my ability to run. It has let us ride together, knee to knee and thighs pressed close beneath the pig blood dash, world flying by, and we could let it go. Because deep within the soft back seat, the revolver smiles and winks, ammunition calls out to be housed, rifles lurk. Forget about the typewriter, all its keys and promise. There is no end to work that can be done. Because we rolled along with eight after the Eastern break, and we were soaring then. The car could have run on nerves and fear alone. Four thin tires bouncing on the rutted earth. Yet freedom's what we knew that day. All Clyde had promised, and he never broke his word. Because it took us on a holiday or two, cruised us past some likely marks, left every other damn car choking in its dust, offered up a welcome bed where drunk or sober bones could rest, a carpet floor both merciful and thirsty, a space where we felt safe enough to sleep. It made us look like winners in this life. Thank you very much. If anyone has something they'd like to ask the authors, one of the authors, Jean. Just be first person because it's 
really just one story. We're going to follow this person. So I made that change. I don't normally write first person. Um, I did try to draw on my experiences of being 22 and sort of some of the dumb things I also remember friends of mine doing at that age and sort of reactionary behavior. But I wouldn't really say that he's, it's certainly not a biographical or autobiographical, but uh, he, you know, I, I share some opinions certainly with, with the character. Thank you. 